Although to be a UFC fighter, you have to be the best fighter on the planet when it comes to your weight class. And we kind of put these guys up on a pedestal, especially when they get three out of four defenses, especially when they break into those pound for pound rankings. They are not perfect, especially inside of the cage. Everybody has their deficiencies. Everybody has flaws, whether it's inside or outside of the cage. And that's what we're going to get into today. We're going to get into every single UFC champion's biggest weakness, their biggest flaw in my eyes. But before we get into it, make sure to like, subscribe, that YouTube said it truly truly does help me out a ton your one like could push it out to a hundred more people with the click of a button takes 0.1 seconds to do and also subscribe because i'm trying to get up to 10k let's get right into it though starting off we're going to start off the 125 pound division and that of course is alexander pantoja pantoja was a guy that i struggled to find a weakness for because he's not exactly a guy that you can kind of look at and immediately go that's the thing he can't do. That's the thing he can't do. You know, like, oh, he's not a good striker. Oh, he's not a good wrestler. It's not that easy with Alexander Pantoja. For me, his biggest weakness is that he fights down to his competition. If you don't know what I mean by when I say that, when he's fighting a Steve Versag, I think that Steve Versag is really, really good. And he really impressed me in that fight against Pantoja. Pantoja should have steamrolled Steve Versay. When you see Pantoja kind of in there against the Roy Val, he should have steamrolled Roy Val. He looked like he was, you know, two or three levels better and he just kind of seemed to coast and seemed to, you know, kind of take it easy on Roy Val. That's something that you don't want if you're a UFC champion. That's something you don't want to be down to your name because there could be an indication where you go up against, say, like a Brandon Moreno, say a Kai Kaurfant is coming up in the division and all of a sudden you're fighting at their level and they can up it two or three more levels, especially someone with really, really good cardio when you get into those final rounds. So Alexander Pantoja, his biggest weakness for me is the fact that he fights down to his competition. We might not always see 100% of Pantoja, depending on who he's fighting. After that, we have 135. 135 is Sean O'Malley. Sean O'Malley, he's gone up against Marab Valashvili at the Sphere. Not too far away now, to be fair. It's kind of after this pay-per-view, we're what, maybe five weeks away from that fight? And this is a terrible stylistic matchup. If you were to just design a matchup for Sean O'Malley and go, let's make a guy, design a guy in a lab to be Sean O'Malley. Elite cardio, elite wrestling. They're the things you want to counter Sean O'Malley with because Sean O'Malley is not a good wrestler, especially compared to his striking. And that is his biggest hole. That's his biggest flaw is his wrestling. His jiu-jitsu, actually, I'd kind of separate his wrestling and his jiu-jitsu because I think, you know, based on what I've watched of Sean O'Malley and his jiu-jitsu, it actually isn't too bad. It looks really good. He's, you know, a brown belt. You don't just get those for free. You don't just get those for nothing, especially when you're, you know, training with Tankinho, Tim Welch, all of these other really, really good Brazilian jiu-jitsu athletes. You don't get those belts for free. So I'd be pretty happy with his jiu-jitsu, but his wrestling, his wrestling is not all that good. We've seen, you know, Pyotr Jan take him down on multiple occasions. Aljo kind of struggled to take him down, but also he didn't have that much time to do it because Sean O'Malley put his lights out. But for 135 for Sean O'Malley, it has to be his wrestling because there's no flaws in his striking, really. After that, we have 145 and Ilya Taporia. Ilya Taporia was by far the most difficult guy to find a flaw for. And it might not be the person that like kind of pops into your name first. He's not a pound for pound number one. He doesn't have, you know, 10 or 11 defenses, but he's just so difficult because when you think about what the two major flaws that you can kind of pick out for somebody are, his striking, something to do with the striking, defense, offense, anything like that, or his wrestling. How good is his wrestling defensively? How good is his wrestling offensively? How good is his jujitsu? With Ilya Taporia, the, the question's answered with all of those. Elite power, elite striking, elite boxing. Yeah, like throw the striking away. That's not a weakness. Then the wrestling, we've seen him wrestle to a super high level. We've seen him submit guys. We know that his jiu-jitsu is really, really good. So what is Ilya Taporia's biggest flaw? For me, it's calf kicks. And this is kind of something that's really, really in-depth. Something that's not like a broader topic. But I think that Ilya Taporia, with all the styles that he has, with everything that he wants to do inside the octagon, if you're asking me, how do I game plan to beat Ilya Taporia? It's calf kicks. That's just what it is. One thing, you take away his power, you take away his springiness, you take away his footwork, you take away all of that with calf kicks. Ilya Taporia, when he's at range, he leans super, super heavy on his front foot. So if you can take that away, if you can, you know, take away his front foot, force him into switching stances, make Ilya Taporia uncomfortable, that is your best chance with beating him. And calf kicks also, the fact that he is so heavy on that front foot, that's where he gets a lot of his power from. He plants that front foot and then kind of springs off into the punches that he wants to throw. So calf kicks for Ilya Taporia, and we, we've we seen him not deal that well with him. Against Bryce Mitchell, against Josh Emmett, he fucked both those guys up, but he didn't deal well with the calf kicks. After that, we have 155. 155 is Islam Makachev, the lightweight champion, the current pound for pound number one. He's another guy 
that it was pretty difficult to think of something. And his stuff is outside of the cage. It's not exactly inside the cage. Because when you look at Islam Makachev, wrestling, striking, can do everything pretty fucking well. I can do everything to a pretty high level. But the one thing that, the one question that I want to answer about Islam Makachev is have him fight outside of Saudi. Have him fight outside of Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, and see how does he do? Because there's kind of a trend that's coming up with a lot of these Dagestani fighters that once you get them in Saudi Arabia, they look fucking unbelievable. They look like world beaters. Umar against Corey, Islam against Volk the second time, Islam against Charles Oliveira. They just look like they are the best fighters on the planet when they're in Saudi Arabia. But once we look at Islam Makachev against high-level competition, because don't get me wrong, he'd beat Dan Hooker in my fucking back garden. Yeah, there's no problems with that. But when we look at the highest of the high-level competition, you have that Volkanovski one fight in Australia, where I think it's the closest Islam's ever come to have losing. I still scored that fight. It's 3-2 Volkanovski. But you can definitely say that it's not Islam's best performance ever. And then we have Dustin Poirier against Islam Makachev in America, where Dustin Poirier, who I thought Islam was going to go out there and just flatline, just smoke, like it wasn't going to be close at all. Dustin Poirier, you know, did really, really well. He put on a good performance for himself. So that's the biggest thing for Islam Makachev for me is, how does he look when he's fighting outside of Saudi Arabia? Because that's one thing you don't want to be locked into. You don't want to have that shower bullet Hamza Chamayev thing where obviously there's for legal reasons, but where you only want to fight in Saudi Arabia and those pay-per-views come around once, maybe twice a year. So that's Islam Makachev. That is his biggest flaw. At 170, we have Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad, the newest champion that we've had inside the UFC. And if we go off that Leon Edwards performance, he looked really, really good against Leon Edwards. The wrestling looked good. The striking looked good. The striking obviously surprised me a shit ton where he just came out there and he looked like a fucking elite striker. But Bilal kind of has a problem that nobody else on this list really has. Everybody else on this list, like, we know what they do really, really well. We know Sean O'Malley's an elite striker. We know Islam's an elite wrestler. We know Ilya has elite KO power. Bilal Muhammad, what does Bilal Muhammad do superbly well? What is he What is he top five at inside the UFC? What is he top three at inside the UFC? Because for every other champion, you can pick something out and go, he's top three at that. He's top three at that. He's top five at that. For Bilal Muhammad, you can't do that. So I think that his biggest downfall is that he doesn't have anything to fall back on. He doesn't have an elite base in anything because although his wrestling is good, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's top five inside the UFC. His striking most definitely is in top five inside the UFC. Jiu-Jitsu is in top five inside the UFC. And then you kind of go into the finer stuff. Cardio, no. Output, no. Like he really doesn't do anything superbly well. And he is just kind of that well-rounded, good mixed martial artist. But that's for sure his biggest flaw for me is that he doesn't actually do anything superbly well. If you guys can think of anything that Bilal Muhammad does to a top three level inside the UFC, please do let me know because nothing came to my mind when I thought about him. After that, we have 185. 185 is Drikas Duplessis. Drikas Duplessis has got a fight coming up against Israel Adesanya. And Drikas Duplessis' best thing is also his worst thing. He's the one guy on this list where I will say his best attribute is also his worst attribute. It's his own style, his own fighting style. I feel like you can only get so far with it. I feel like he's capped. He's almost maxed out at where he's at because with that kind of weird, unorthodox striking where it's like your head's kind of all over the place, your feet are kind of all over the place. And it doesn't really make sense that you're a UFC champion. It doesn't make sense that you're the best fighter, 185 pounds with that style. But he is. He is the 185 pound champion. He's the rightful 185 pound champion with his own kind of niche style. And it makes it really difficult to prepare for. I've talked about this a ton. Getting a Drikas Duplessis sparring partner against someone to replicate Drikas Duplessis is borderline impossible. But also, like when you're Drikas Duplessis, if you go up against an elite striker like Israel Adesanya, that kind of weird head movement, that kind of, you know, unprecise, really unorthodox stuff, that only works to a certain level. You see it with a guy like Ben Whitaker in the boxing scene. That's only going to work that flashy style where he's kind of doing no-luck punches and, you know, taking the piss out of the guys that he's fighting. That's only going to work to a certain point until you're in there with fucking better BF and he just takes your chin clean off your shoulders. So for, so for Drikas Duplessis, it has to be his own style. His own style limits where he can get inside the UFC pyramid, but it's also how he's gotten to where he's at right now. After that, we have 205. 205 for Alex Pereira. Alex Pereira is probably the easiest person on this list to find a weakness for. Everybody knows Alex Pereira's weakness. We're not going to go through some fancy thing where we say like, oh yeah, when he goes southpaw, his left hook, he drops his right hand 30%. We're not going to throw all that bullshit, okay? We all know what Alex Pereira's biggest weakness is. It's the wrestling. It's his wrestling and his jiu-jitsu. He was one person, I said that, you know, you don't get brown belts, you don't get black belts for nothing. 
With Alex Pereira, I don't understand how he has a black belt legit. I'd love to see if Alex Pereira did a YouTube video of just like rolling against other black belts, rolling against, I don't know, some Gracie black belt, some 10th planet black belt, some of those guys, because his timeline of getting a black belt just does not make sense to me, especially when you combine it with the fact that he was doing MMA training, that he was training four strikers against Israel Adesanya, you're not exactly drilling your wrestling a whole bunch. Against Sean Strickland, you're not exactly drilling your wrestling a whole bunch. You're drilling your striking against those guys. So the timeline of him getting a black belt, it, it doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to me. But for Alex Barrett, it has to be his wrestling. We saw Jan Blakovic wrestle him. We saw Israel Adesanya wrestle him. We haven't seen that many guys try to take him down in the past few fights out of their own stupidity, but it's wrestling. There's nothing else. After that, we have the two heavyweight champions. We have obviously our interim champion, Tom Aspinall, and then our undisputed champion, John Jones. I'm going to start off with John Jones and I'm going to go into Tom Aspinall. John Jones... He is the greatest of all time. And the greatest of all time means that he does not have a lot of weaknesses. When you can think of a weakness in John Jones's arsenal, there's not really a lot. Striking, no. I don't think you could say striking is a weakness. Wrestling, definitely not. As wrestling is a weakness. Jiu-Jitsu, definitely not. Cardio, no. Like, there's really nothing for John Jones. There is one, though. It's his age. It's his battle against father time. John Jones is biggest question mark john jones's biggest weakness is the fact that he is getting older to the fact that he is old now i don't think if john jones was 30 anybody would be like tom aspinall's gonna beat him tom aspinall's gonna smoke him this fight isn't gonna be close because we know that he would be coming off you know those two daniel cormier performances the destruction of gustafson but john jones is just at that point now where john jones is far beyond his peak and don't get me wrong john jones being far beyond his peak is still better than 99 percent of ufc fighters but it's his battle against age. It's his battle against father time that he's currently losing. And then finally, we have the interim champion, Tom Aspinall. Tom Aspinall's biggest weakness. And I feel like a lot of people don't really point out a lot of weaknesses in Tom Aspinall. They just kind of treat him as this like godlike figure just because he has that average fight to him because he's knocking everybody out. But when you watch Tom Aspinall fights, we can all see his striking defense is not that good. It's not that good. And I think he'd struggle against an elite counter puncher like an Alex Pereira, like a Cyril Gann. Somebody like that obviously could take down Cyril Gann. But Tom Aspinall's striking defense is just straight up not that great. Not only is he super hittable, he floats his chin in the air. Anytime you see Tom Aspinall punch, he punches like this with his chin up in the air, just ready to be hit. And then you see once he does get hit, once he does get clipped a little bit, he doesn't have the best defensive instincts on the planet either. He doesn't, you know, kind of go into a more defensively secure stance. He doesn't kind of, you know, shell up a little bit, make sure that he's okay. He just kind of wiggles and worms his head around a lot. And when you go up against an elite striker, like an Alex Pereira, like an Israel Adesanya, obviously they're not going to fight in him, but they're elite strikers, okay? Once you go up against someone like that, once they smell blood in the water, this whole like swing my head around in all these kind of random crazy directions... That ain't going to work against them. That's not going to work against them. You're going to get your head taken clean off your shoulders. But that is every single UFC champion's biggest weakness. Make sure to like, sub, on their YouTube channel. I'll catch you boys tomorrow. Peace.